Hi there. Welcome to the certification demonstration today. Can you guys hear me okay? Nobody can hear me? Everybody can hear me? Okay, good. Um, certification, I think, is one of the most uh, important things I ever did in my career and for my skill set in my education. And so, welcome to the certification demonstration where we can answer any questions that you have about certification. Make sure you understand completely how it is scored. And then Jacob, of course, is going to demonstrate uh, and I'll narrate you through that. If you have your certification, we're going to um, really just go right through the diet and make sure everyone understands. If there's a section that one of them are talking or demonstrating, something that is uh, an issue to you or you have a question about understanding what is being asked of you, you can have questions and answers throughout the entire thing. Don't wait until the end just do a lot of refreshing your memory and what you talk about. So the first thing you do when you're going to have a certification program is you're going to do a study guide from the AFA office. I think they're $16, something like that. $15. Um, I'm sure they have something in the office here today. First thing you're going to do is read this book. Read it, read it, read it, read it. And make sure you understand what is being asked of you. A lot of us shoe horses in different styles, different disciplines, and varying degrees of weight from the movement, the various ways of doing things. What the test is asking you to do is do it by the guideline. It doesn't mean that there's not other ways of shoeing horses or other ways that work. It's a skills test when you do what you say you can do. And if we say put the nail in the center of the steel, put the nail in the center of the steel. You also know you can put it fine or coarse according to the structure of the you have that you're currently shoeing. So remember, there's a lot of things that are just simply a skills test to see can you do what you say you can do. If you say you can fit with uh, X amount of expansion, when you do that, you also know you can fit tight for you wide when needed. So keep that in mind. When you get to the test, uh, you can take all three portions of the exam at one time. You can take one portion, two portions, and three portions to all levels of the exam. A written exam, a shoe display, which is a uh, book that you bring for ready to present at the certified level. You have all the time in the world to compare those shoes. It should be an example of your finest workmanship. The nails should all drop in the holes, and the shoes should all be flat and level. They need to be nailable shoes to fit to the pattern that you present in order to be schooled. Then you have your practical exam, which is what Jacob is going to here today, and we'll do a lot of talking about. So his horse is presented to him, he's allowed to take off the steel shoes or whatever on. If there's shoes on, you can take off the shoes. You're asked to use a punch cutter or crease nail pullers to remove the shoes, not to disturb the hook wall by using a rasping uh, type of method of removing the punches. Once the shoes are popped off, you can wire brush, pick, no sharp tools in the foot, only just removing debris and being ready for the script. It's a great idea at that time to have your testers take a look at your feet that you're going to shoe. Uh, certified, you're going to be doing either a pair of front or a pair of hind. And if you're doing a journeyman or a tradesman, obviously you're going to be a pair of fourth. Tradesmen would do take shoes, journeyman is with handmade shoes. The certified level is, is to take shoes. So Jacob's going to do, uh, I believe he said he's going to do left front in a certified, yeah. and the left hind is a journeyman. So you're going to get a little bit of both demonstrations here with him. He'll have his tester look at his feet. That gives the tester the ability to see what he's beginning with so that he can tell whether Jacob has improved the job, kept the job in a neutral state, or if he's done something detrimental. Yeah. So there's certain things like maybe medial lateral balance is one of the items that there's not enough foot capsule for it to be adjusted very much. That's it. Or at all. Give the candidate the opportunity to show the tester this is what I'm beginning with. Maybe it's a frog, but it's absolutely beautiful. It's already well maintained naturally by the environment you're living in. And there is nothing to do to the frog. You can also see you were smart enough to leave your knife in your pocket. And you can get some points from not addressing.
addressing something that is already in a perfect state. So then you're going to be coming up with your game plan and identifying as you're looking at the feet, cleaning them out. What do I need to do? What does the address it? If it needs no well, take your wire brush to it or your, or your sanding block, just your sponge block, and just highlight it. That lets the tester know, I know there's a frog here, I know it doesn't need anything done to it. I've addressed it by letting you know I'm leaving it alone. That makes sense. So the first thing Jacob's doing is uh, trimming his foot, he's trimming his frog, establishing a clean, clean out in his connoisseurs. The frog trim, ideally, is a nice, clean, straight line with your knife. Having a sharp knife is part of the test of the exam. Uh, typically, we'll fly our knife into the frog connoisseurs at the exact, at the opposite angle of what the bar is. A well-trimmed bar will give you a guide of what you want the angle of your frog to trim down. If there's a simple pistol full of horn material, uh, frog material, clean that out, identify the central saltness of the frog. But what's the primary job of frog? <laughs> right? It's, it's traction, is a main function of the frog. So the more we trim on the frog, the more we reduce traction. Keep that in mind. You want nice, strong frogs that are um, beneficial to the animal. <clears throat> Jacob's going at it and, and addressing his sole. So the sole should be trimmed to a sound length. You're better to be a little bit too long than too short. Educated as far as what happened, 
have maybe possible solutions to prevent disaster. The testers, the examiners, everybody there wants to see your success. We all are pulling for every candidate to be able to achieve the old level. So if there gets to a situation where you can stop, we really want to make sure that you understand why and teach you how to overcome that so that when you return and have to make take the test again, you don't have to lose any issues. All of that is together annually, and uh, every other year we get together and we take, take the exams ourselves or portions of the exams and, and standardize to make sure that every examiner is on the same page as far as interpreting the flow and delivering the information to the candidates. And it's our job as examiners to pass that information on to the testers so that all the testers are also equally standardized in understanding the guidelines that we uh, so Jacob's looking at his medial lateral balance right now, and he's probably looking at his flat as well. The balance is subjective. Uh, the evaluation will be made on the criteria established below. So a 10 is the horse stands in the middle of the hook, and the ground surface of the hook is trimmed perpendicular to the center line of the <laughs> And we, if you watch Doug's presentation, the other day, there's ultimate ways of looking book balance. That's why we're going by what is presented in the book. We don't always get the best balance of feet or legs or horses for our exam. And we're not asking for therapeutic shoeing on the day of the exam. We're asking for the shoeing that follows the protocol in the book. And we quite often, after the exam is over with, remove shoes that are not appropriate for the horse and fit them appropriately before they go home. So, don't let that be a, a battle in your head. You're shooting the horse wrong. Shoot it according to the book. And then whatever needs to be done to the horse will be done before they leave and uh, go back. We do try to get the best animal available. And there's varying degrees of that, depending on what part of the country you're in and things like that. Jacob, if there's any time you want to interject, feel free to. Okay. He doesn't. Really Good for now. Okay, thanks. <laughs> you might drop a hint for the pre-certification stuff too. Though. Oh yeah, that's great. Yeah. So one thing that Jake did just mention is that the certification committee also has a um, pre-certification clinic that they offer through the AFA. You have to apply to it through the office, just like um, your host group or your. A warehouse or somebody with a writing table or whatever can apply and host a pre-certification workshop and then we have certified instructors Jacob's being one of them uh, let me see if I can remember uh, Justin Frank is a certified instructor uh, Dusty Franklin nope. no help me out who's the other one Doug Russo Doug Russo Eric Gilliland Eric Gilliland Lucas Gilliland Lucas Gilliland Sam Durham. Sam Durham. West Yard. Say it again. West Yard. West Yard. So Brian, those are Brian, their, Brian, their, Brian, their Brian, mothers Brian. are CI, certified instructor. So they'll come or it. some or all of them, depending on the size of it, come to your host event and conduct a certification workshop to help you prepare and get ready to understand these tests. Um, they usually are approximately 45 days or so prior to the exam that we call usually in the same region. Well, one thing I would say about the frog is you know, it's only scored one, so don't spend all day training at the Okay, so Jacob's point is uh, one thing about the frog is it only gets scored one time in your hook prep. So don't get carried away spending all kinds of time trimming your frog. There are, there are things that are going to be scored twice, um, several items, and they might need more of your time. You're looking for some symmetry and balance in that frog when you do trim it in cleanliness. You don't want your frog to be trappy. And a, a well-trimmed frog is, is quite often what you base the whole rest of your trim on. So in that fact, don't disregard it as not being important. It really sets up the rest of your trend.
one of those washing trimmers. You need to work into your practice at home. It's hard to practice an entire hour. A lot of people say, well, there's an hour to that. to the book, not necessarily the way this horse is. 
is, but according to the book, it's appropriate. We do a lot of feeling with our hands. Feeling the edges. You can feel things you can't see. Didn't take very much length off of it at all. Doesn't need length, and he needs a little something to burn. So he's given himself something to burn, and I know that. Now, if he comes over and he, he doesn't burn it, maybe that's re reevaluated that he left it too long for what he intended to burn. The edges are nice and smooth. A little bit of a sharp edge right there on that. One thing that that does though is when you're sighting the foot, a nice sharp, crisp edge makes it really visual to having a flat foot. When you start rolling and, and smoothing the edges, it takes away the crispness of the line. So we didn't do a whole lot to the AP balance. There wasn't a lot of foot to work with. I can't hardly hit him very hard uh, at all. And it's, it's quite appropriate for what he was presented with. The frog on this one, uh, it's okay. It's okay for sure. There's a couple of little things right here that I can maybe critique them on. Maybe just a, a little straighter line going through there. But it's a good clean out. It's addressed a little bit of this to tags in the back. There's nothing really for the central focus. I can say that that frog is probably an eight. So, like I said, I give him a ten. It's very flat. He left a whole bunch of dirt over here. All of this is dirty. And that's a good indication that that's the way he found the foot. And he's not claiming it. If he had taken a sanding block and cleaned that all up and rasped it all clean, then he owns whatever it is. If it's a notch in the foot or a broken spot, if it's clean, you did it. So if it was in the foot before you got there, leave it dirty.
know, we go all the way. We go all the way around the hoof wall, and we go into the commissar and around the point of the heel, so that we can determine whether you have retrimmed the foot between the time we scored it and the time you come with your your, your shoe nailed down. So that's what you can expect the uh, black marker to look like. So after the trim is scored, you can come and burn your shoe. After you burn your shoe, make sure that you remove any sole pressure that you have. And your, your sole pressure, walk on tap. These are things that are scored three, uh, in the category two as well as in category three. So these are some of the things you really want to make sure you address when you're happy with before you move on to the mailing and fitting part because you'll be scored twice on it. It doesn't mean that you can't improve it. If you burn a shoe on and if you're burning it nice and flat and you improve it from one second to the next, of course the change may go up. Thank <laughs> you. 
this is certainly, it's got great wall contact going on. Uh, there's no sole pressure there. The fit is really nice. Coming back to the back part of the foot, the foot's got a little bit of a old lateral heel on it. A little bit of trick here in the fit. See the center tree in the foot. It's not there. And then the test requires a particular fit. You can't really go to the center tree. Sure. So it makes it a little trickier, but he's done appropriately for the diving star. You have to have an average of seven or above. So
technology is no fun. We just don't. I mean, we used to talk about it, but you're not calling an AB or C fit anymore. And an AB or C fit will all score under center of stock technology. So the whole center of stock thing, we were trying to eliminate some of the confusion or misunderstandings about AB and C, which AB and C came up about because we were trying to eliminate the lack of terminology before that. So we have just created more and more dialogue and ultimately I feel like we're just back to where we were before. Like maybe there's a lot to do it at all. You're trying to be something that is easier to understand and it seems like it's just made it a little bit more complicated to understand. Because A, B, and C will always score if it's just no longer a 10 or a 9 or an 8 or whatever. And everybody was calling a B-fit and doing a C-fit anyways, right? Like, it's amazing when you start putting a ruler to it. And, and put the ruler to your own work. When you're at home practicing, you're trimming feet or Get all the tools that your testers use. They use calipers to, to measure the distance of your, uh, your shoes, things like that. Use the same thing. Have a flat surface. Uh, have the score your own work. We're usually harder on ourselves than anybody else, so score your own work and, and you'll force yourself to, to reach your skills. There is a copy of the score sheet in the back of the question was where do you get the score sheet? There's a copy of the score sheet in the back of the book. They're also online. If you go to the app or the online website, click on the certification tab, the drop down box comes up on uh, forms. And it may say like host forms, the district forms, forms. Every single form that the committee has is in the app. And you can print off as many as you want.
the stuff way out there from the quarter. It seems to be a gradual arrangement of why it's going. But I think that it, by just pumping all the way around to your quarter, with the radius of your shoe matches the radius of your book capsule, you can be pretty appropriate, right? Heel length. The question is, what about heel length? Heel length and heel expansion are basically the same thing, just in a different direction. So heel length is measured from the point of the heel straight back in line with the track. Not to the point of the heel. If you've got one of those feet that really rapid the heels come and point to each other, well, wherever you leave the steel, if you leave it clear behind the foot, measures all that length. It doesn't mean the line that is measured in line with the track, not following around the point where the heel is Does that make sense? So that brings up a whole other part of the test of whether you're doing a journeyman exam is really important. That you're forging the appropriate check into the heel of the shoe. And now it's certified. Maybe you're not forging it in there, but maybe you're rasping your checks in there. And when you measure the center of steel, you're measuring where the heel sits in the center of the steel. So if I put a really nice, deliberate heel check in there, and it's following the compasseurs of the frog, now the width of my material at the heel is narrower there than it is in the other branch, other parts of the branch of the shoe. So if I've got it narrowed up in that heel, and I'm no longer three quarters, but now I'm in five eighths at the heel, I'm the center of the five eighths, not the center of the three quarters. Does that make sense? So being able to properly fit the heel comes in a huge play with the center of the heel and steel. That create more questions or answer There's lots of different ways to fit the heel, right? presented with to begin with.
So I'm going to talk about the nail and the finish. Could, are you done with the front? Not really. Okay, I'm not going to then. I'll, I'm going to do it now, and then I'm going to let oh, you finish go ahead. it. I, there's not a yeah, much I can do left with it, so. Huh? Not much I can do right now. Okay. <laughs> no pressure. So when the, when the test is expired, it's time to come over and, and evaluate the nailing and finish. First thing they're doing is, is walking up, looking at the presentation of the job, looking at the nail light, looking at the alignment, uh, looking at the shoe position. Certified seem to get hit hard a lot when your shoe moves when the nail on. And there's ways to overcome that. First of all, your first strap is two nails. Maybe you don't see the first nail all the way down. You've got it started, the shape of the nail is holding you into a very close position to where you want it, or back to where you want it. If you sink the nail head in, sometimes it'll shift that shape. The nail locks you into the hole. It'll move one way or another. Recognize that it's done that. And then with the next nail, use that to your day, shove the shoe back to where you want it. So if I put the nail in the center of the nail hole and try to direct it straight, it should have no movement whatsoever. If I put it in the front of the nail hole, I should be able to drive that shoe towards the sun. If I put it in the back of the nail hole, I should be able to suck that shoe back to the sun. Put it on the inside, move it one way, outside the other. So they use that to your advantage, but be aware of it. Because sometimes you're not aware of it, and it does it, and you're like, shoot, what is it? So know that that happens, and use it to your advantage. What's that? You're not out of time, are you? Oh, you're out of time. He's out of time. Done. Time goes off. So, the first thing I'm doing, as I said, is I'm doing a site evaluation. As I'm walking up to it, I'm looking at the things I know are on the scorecard. I'm looking at nail height. I'm looking at the shape of them, uh, the location, the line. And right away, I'm thinking, uh, looks like the nails are getting lower towards the heel. That's OK. They're supposed to be, right? They need to be one third the distance from the ground up. They need to be two thirds distance from the coronary band down, and then you can go on all the way up to So no problem there. It's a good idea to have your ruler to measure your weight. It's amazing how one third is higher than most people think it is. Really. It used to say one and the other, and the alignment on. The book now says the nails exit the hook wall in a straight line parallel to the corner. Where it did used to say that was the question. Could it be parallel with the ground or the shoe? Which it did used to say that word in the book. But now the can definition is in line with the corner again. So the second part of clinches, the clinches are square, set to the wall, and they align with the nail shaft. So I'm going to get down here and look. Are they square? That one's a little bit long. That one's maybe a little bit short. And that one's a little bit what we'll call with the sweat. It looks like it's being pulled back towards the heel instead of straight down in alignment with the nail shaft. Looking at the other side, those look nice and strong. I can see inside the hole to the nail shaft and making sure that the nail wasn't overdressed or weakened. I'm feeling it with my hands. I want it to be nice and smooth, no sharp edges. And at this point, his black. Go ahead. Oh, you're good. Yeah. Go ahead. This the black marker is removed all around where the clinches were and through the toe. I can still see the black marker around the heels and the expansion, which is a nice to see because uh, he didn't go in there and remove that horn behind there just to remove the, the marker. The marker will not cause you any ill effect. I'm looking for rasp marks in the hook. 
there's, there's nothing detrimental. They're not deep. Sanding block making would even have taken them out. It's not required. You cannot put any artificial topical dressing onto any of the feet when you're working on them. But you are allowed to rub your good hard sweat into there and put a little polish on it. Okay, uniformity, the pinches are identical, strong, square, and set to the whole wall. They're definitely set to the whole wall. A couple of them I can just feel, and sometimes I can feel just a little bit of the burn of the hook material. You're not required to under gouge, but I recommend it. If you use a rasp and go underneath each one, try not to leave any evidence of a line from using the rasp edge there. The hook wall is smooth. The hook wall dressing should not exceed two-thirds of the height of the hook wall. The hook and shoe have no sharp edges. All clinches are tight to the wall and there are no sharp edges. The clinches are well fit to the wall. There is no evidence of rasp marks or over gouging under the clinch. So one of the other things you'll, I use it as a trick all the time, but could be caught on certification with it. If I have my nail bites, I maybe stagger just a wee little bit, and I want my nails to be in a perfectly straight line, I may under gouge a longer depth underneath the foot wall and pull my touch down to line up with the other nails. The evidence shows if something is smart enough to look, the evidence is there that the hole above my nail shank is longer than the other one.
that. I did that. Give it the expansion that sold it. Question. Okay, so the, the question, can you clarify the difference between your on-site modification and your pattern? Good that you brought that up. When you come with your shoe display, you are required to provide the shoe pattern that all your fronts will fit and all your hinds will fit. You are required to modify your own patterns to accommodate the clips that you make. So you're going to make your shoe, create your, your shape to it, now you're going to pull your clips to your pattern, then you're going to go to your grinder and get out your hot racks or whatever you have to do and adjust your pattern to accommodate for your clips, just as if it was a book pattern. When you are on your on-site mod, a pattern is given to you and it has maybe clip notches already in it. You don't have to try and fit those specific notches. Does that explain the differences between your on-shoe display, or on uh, your shoe display and your on-site modification? You should be scoring your, when you're doing your shoe display, too. get out the test book, get out the score sheet. Be your own tested, be your own examiner, score your own work. I got the best shot, best shot book award one time, and I had Jim Cook as my striker, and before the time I went off, he said, just pretend you're the judge. And I pretended I was the judge as the one up, and I won. Question. I don't know if it's ever been clarified. Yeah, the question was, when did that get clarified about the clips? I think it's something we haven't really had a lot of discussion about, and there hasn't been a lot of uh, attention brought to it. I know I had a candidate recently. He sat there and asked about the clips, rest on the clips, rest on the clips. I had good clips. And I thought that, I was like, man, I wish I was for your record. Yep, the tester. Some of that might show when I get to his foot, and I might have a lack of wall contact there. Clips are good, they're set into the wall, they're pitched at the angle, all the edges are finished. I can see his burn mark, I can see the boxing on there. Don't, uh, um, just because it's shiny doesn't mean it's boxed, so be careful about that. Nail placement, 
the leading corner of the nail in line straight across the web of the shoe, widest point at the widest point of the of the foot, equally spaced in between, appropriate source, blah blah blah. The nice thing about the journeyman shoes, if they're done well, I don't have to help them. It fits, the, the notches grab it. I know exactly where he intends to nail it on. It's gonna stay right there. Shoe fit from the toe to the widest point, expansion behind. Checking it, he's got a 10 on his flat. He's got a 10 on wall contact. Uh, I can see just a wee bit of daylight underneath. And when I looked at it here, I could see just a wee tiny bit of a, what do you call that? Where are you from? Screw up. Oh, well, well, it's normally like if I would, it's a Michigan Utah. suck if I'm, a Utah, it's a Utah suck, I guess. And so I, I saw that when I was looking at his foot, and the, uh, the shoe and the flat. And so when I go to the foot, I as a tester immediately check, do I have daylight right there? And there's just a tiny little bit, but I do know from enough experience, by the time he gets done nailing it and clinching it, it's going to be gone. But right now I can I can hit him just a half a point on that, or two, or, or two points. <laughs> okay, sorry. Question. Oh. Hang on. When they're done, I want to point something out before I know it up. <laughs> Okay, so back here farther, you can see there's not even any burn on this portion of the foot. So if I come up here with the shoe and I can see daylight, which I can. Can you see it this way? Can you, can you see Try and get some daylight. I'm trying to. Yeah, there's a little bit. That's can you see that spot right there? There's a bit of daylight in there. And that's where the burn isn't even on the foot. That, he didn't own it. It was on the foot before he started. He left it there through the entire process. And if it's still there after it's nailed and clinched, no consequence to him at all. I don't know if you can get where you can see the daylight in the toe. Uh, we'll nail it on, then you can look at it. Okay. See if you can get, <laughs> see if you can get down. Can you? <laughs> It's pretty hard to see because it doesn't get clear enough. But when I move that foot, I can see the rubber mat underneath there. If I held a white paper there, maybe I'd be able to see the white through there. But it's so minimal, I know that once you nails it on, it's going to stop down. But the quarter, I expect to see the daylight there. So for an job to be completed, all the clinches must be full. They do not have to be rest. They do not have to be smooth, even. They have, in order for it to be considered complete, they need to be folded over. And I'll tell you, when I do courses every day at home, I use a memory gouge, and I fold them with the clincher, and I fit them with my, I rub my hand across it to determine how much rest is on the high road will do on these clinches. So I think a lot of the problem with the clinching, people aren't creating a place for the clinch to go. And, and then they rasp them off with some weeds or they're too 
plow and if they were asking too much to get them smooth and they could remove too much of it. So think about the parents need to remove in order to create a place for the flinch to, to live. Just their, the shank's a little bit different size than this one, so clinch them and everything's different. That's why they're not as not as good as they could have been. God, I hate to take those off. <laughs> but the wife wants them that way. So. You know who the boss is. Yep. I've been married for 25 years. I know. <laughs> Don't forget about being able to bump material and you know, using that like a savings account. 
verse, all of a sudden you're like, oh man, I'm too short. Let's we'll scale it back up. So it's been one now you go. Get around. You cannot pull a shoe in the middle of the stretch down. You cannot grip one. So if you're like, oh man, I'm going to do my lateral heel. Just right there. And you're going to miss it. Pull that lateral heel. You're allowed to do that. You're going to roll those shoes. Yes, the question was on the journeyman run. Are all the shoes plain stamped only? Absolutely. Very simple shoes, six nails. You can alter the amount of nails in the foot on approval of the, from the examiner or the tester in the event that there's broken, cracked, foot wall, something that the formerty is that it's going to be a copy. He's allowed to remove the Sharpie marker at this point. I've already scored his trim. I've scored the shoe shape and fit according to it. Now that he's nailing and clinching it, he can remove the marker in order to finish his job. I already know. Oh, I already know. And, I, and it goes quite often the rat is on the shoulder as well. So there's a straight line where it closes and dubbed off. And we write notes. Some of these testers and examiners, it's scribbles all down the sides. We're writing each other, uh, writing notes to ourselves so that we can be reminded throughout the course of the day what we want to be, what occurs from one stage to the next. So we don't get confused by which what what for it. Done. He's done. See, time is up. Did you rub sweat on it? Thank I you. Have sound block if we don't have one. So. so you can, you'll see, there's a little bit of toe exposure here where the foot was not, and he shot it to the foot, which is appropriate. You're allowed to shoe where the foot should be. If it's not there, I'm feeling the clinches. Mm, they're not as smooth as a baby's butt, but they're certainly appropriate and safe. They're, I like the nail height and alignment. They're up a good distance, one third the distance. These are more in line with the shoe than they are the coronary band. It's not detrimental, but it's not a 10. Maybe I'm gonna have to give them a nine or an eight for nail alignment. I like the quality of the clinches. They seem to be strong. They're well set into the wall. They're square. They're tidy. The, the clinch is above the nail shape. Not windswept, pulled back and forward. I'm going to make just to see a tiny little bit of daylight in that wall contact. Yep. So it didn't suck down as much as I had hoped. I was really hoping Jacob would improve that score, but I have to give him the score he presented at the timer. You can't win them all. It's certainly a very solid job, definitely appropriate. So although it has some holes in it and it has some flaws in it, this is definitely the type of work we expect to see from journeymen doing their exam. Solid, safe, do you want to add any comments, Jacob? I'd just say don't, you know, use your own tools on the day. Oh, yeah, yeah. Use what you're familiar with. Right. Th that's something, too. Like, we're sharing tools, and you're using something that you're not familiar with. It doesn't run just like your own does. And even nails. Use the nails you use every yeah, day. Yeah, exactly. Well, I struggled on the fronts because I don't use those nails. They're just a little bit different shank size than the ones I use on the hind. That's what I drive every day is what I use on the hind. So use yes. what you're familiar with. That you know, if you're going, to, you're taking your own stuff anyway, so. And don't use a brand new rasp. Right, that's a great, great tip right there. Before you go to your exam, the use it for at least one day before you go to an exam. On clean horses, obviously, but let that rasp be broken in just a little bit so it's not grabby, you're not fighting it, and you're not leaving a lot of harsh rasp marks in the feet. Good, good point. Don't be afraid to change your plan as you go, though. If all of a sudden you're like, 
I, I thought I had my hammer. I don't have my hammer. Yeah. Okay, pull up your pants and grab somebody else's hammer. And if you can, practice a little bit beforehand. It's okay to get familiar. Every, I mean, everybody wants everybody to help each other and succeed. But you have to put in the hard work. It is hard work. And you have to put in the hard work. So don't come if you haven't put in that hard work and you haven't practiced and you haven't reached out. All of the testers, all of the examiners are all very approachable. Don't let these people seem intimidating. We're all the same. We all went through the same exact process. We all did our certifieds. We all had the same anxiety or the same fears or the same questions as all of you guys do. And the reason we do this is we want to give back to the industry. We want to give back to the programs that help sculpt our careers and make us the barriers we are. And, and it's everybody pulling along the next guy. And don't be afraid to become a tester, become an examiner, do the specialty endorsements, give back to the association, join a committee. If it's not certification, join another committee. And this is our association. It's what we make of it. And we all have something to contribute. Craig Stark, our chairman, thank you for being here.